Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have William Trainer, the CEO of Grand West Transportation. Grand West trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol BUS and on the OTC under the symbol GWTN. The company is trading at 78 cents with roughly 76 million shares outstanding or about a $60 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Hey, thanks, Trevor. Uh, yeah, great to have Will uh, on board with us today. Um, Will, uh, I think last or the first time I met you was a couple years ago. And I think I saw like one of your first buses coming off the line or, or in your facility out there. And um, I think it's all to go over Abbotsford. I can't remember exactly where you guys are, but um, you, guys, you guys have certainly come a long way. Um, happy to have you uh, with us today. And um, I understand you got a presentation you'll, uh, you'll kick off for us. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. No problem. Kick it off now? Yeah, go ahead. Go kick it off whenever you want. Yeah. Okay, I think we're there now. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Hello, guys. Thank you. And thanks for. That didn't show up there. What? There we go. Yeah, that's it. Okay, sorry about that. Let's start again here. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on, uh, Paul. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's been quite some time since we had you out and looked at the buses, and I think we've come a long ways uh, uh, since then. So I'd like to uh, present my corporate presentation here to everybody. So Grand West, we are a bus manufacturer. We manufacture and distribute vicinity branded buses for private and public customers in Canada and the US. We own all of our intellectual property. And I think that's a very key point when we're uh, uh, selling these buses. Capital structure. A uh, key point on our capital structure here is that the insider and founder ownership is 30%. Uh, I'm one of the uh, large shareholders as well. Company highlights. What we'd like to uh, present here and, and get across is that we need a contract manufacturer. This give, uh, we have a very low overhead. Uh, our break even is about 100 buses per year. Um, and by contract manufacturing, we don't have to have the cost of a very high uh, manufacturing facility. We've demonstrated a very good market acceptance. We have 90% market penetration in the Canadian market, and we're growing substantially in the U.S. We are a, a, a peer play focused niche market. That means that we've really developed this bus from the ground up. So it's, it's not by um, developing it by the ground up. We've really been able to focus on what the customer's needs are. The heavy duty market, our, our bus, our, our niche market bus that we have, we're playing in the uh, small side of the heavy duty bus market for our heavy duty product. The heavy duty product buses have to last 10 to 12 years when they're bought by the transit authorities throughout North America. The market sales annually for this segment of the market is over 6,000 vehicles per year. When we look at, uh, on the bottom here, breakdown of where the buyers are. You have your large uh, metropolitan buyers, which would be somebody like a New York City, and then you have your urban and your municipal. We play really in the urban and the municipal markets, uh, primarily in the municipal market with 900 operators, and it's about 28% of that current heavy duty marketplace. Uh, that's where we're really been having a very good success. Our bus is designed much like the heavy duty buses. So it has a complete monocoque uh, style construction chassis, which gives you the longevity that you want in it. We really have all the big bus technology in a plat in a compact platform. And where we're, where we're seeing the customers buying ours is really in the right sizing of their fleets. 
There's so many areas where a 40 foot bus just doesn't fit. If you're downtown in the metropolitan areas, a 40 foot is probably the best fit. But when you get into these urban and municipal areas where we're playing, our market share really is, you need a feeder bus. You need a bus that's capable to go into the, into the uh, urban areas and pick up customers and transport them into the main lines. And that's where our bus really shines, our heavy duty product. Now, we're very excited because we've opened up the market by moving into a different segment. This, this new segment that we're moving into is the light duty uh, market segment. The light duty market is usually more of a cutaway style bus. You see this mostly in your metropolitan areas, like in Vancouver, you'd see it. It's uh, uh, the blue buses that are running around. They're built on uh, a cabin chassis. So that means that the manufacturers are buying a van style product and then putting a bus um, uh, chassis, a, a bus configuration on the back of it. And what we've done in this light duty uh, market is we're really bringing in a, a true monocoque style constructed frame, much like our heavy duty one, but completely lightened up. This market segment is about 16,000 vehicles per year. Um, we're, we feel we're competing in an addressable market of about 6,000 annual sales in that market. What's exciting in this market here is that when we, we're just introducing the, this product line, um, the first buses coming in are actually in a gas configuration. The gas configuration that we're providing is really a, um, a Ford engine and transmission. And by adding the automotive style components in there, we've been, we've br been able to bring this bus in extremely competitive. So we can actually price it dollar for dollar where the cutaway market is really being priced. But what, what was really exciting on this, elect or on this smaller market is that we've now added an electric vehicle. This slide here really shows you the trends of what's happening in the electric vehicle market. As you can see, the trends are upward on it. Over the past six months, we've seen a, a tremendous increase in customers asking for an electric vehicle. So we've gone ahead and we've developed ours, our electric vehicle uh, with the automotive style components in it. And in doing this, we've kept that product extremely competitive but we've also kept it very user friendly. So when you've got a transit authority looking to purchase a small shuttle bus or a small bus like this, they can actually plug it in and to a standard outlet, much like your car, like a Tesla car or any of your uh, EV cars, um, which in that vehicle, it would have a charger on board. So this really makes it user friendly to the transit authorities and to the shuttle operators that are going to be buying it. And we have um, the components that we've chosen for this. We've really taken our time to enter this space. Uh, and we've, we've partnered up with some automotive style components and some automotive um, manufacturers to put this type of uh, uh, components in our vehicle. And we think that it's really going to have a high demand and be a, a, a true winner in the marketplace. Now we're very proud of our vehicle. Our heavy duty vehicle, we sent it down to uh, FTA Altoona testing. This is a Federal Transportation Administration's test on the vehicle. And we've, we got best in class out of our size of vehicle. So we're very proud on what we've done and the achievements that we've uh, got with that vehicle down there. Our corporate timeline, really we began back in 2008. Uh, BC Transit was looking for somebody to design and develop a mid-sized bus when there really wasn't something currently available in the marketplace. Since then, we have captured the market in Canada and now we're focused on the market in the U.S. Our business model, when we look at the global business, we feel we set up something that's a little different than everybody else has. We globally source all of our supply chain. And in that, we, it allows us to source the best and latest technologies. This gives us a very competitive price, quality, and innovation. 
and we have the ability to assemble globally. Manufacturing in the US, we can manufacture in Canada, Europe, and in Asia. In the US, we partner up with the Alliance Bus Group. They're one of our, they are our national distributor. They're one of the largest US retailers in the US. They have national distribution. They provide parts, sales, and service for us. And one of the key points here with the Alliance Bus is that they're currently providing about 10% of the cutaway market in North America. So total cutaway market being approximately 22,000 with all the vehicles combined, they're selling in anywhere from 2,500 on the average of 2,500 units per year. So when we're now adding our light duty vehicle into our mix, we feel that uh, we've got the, the uh, really good distribution chain to get the vehicle out to the market. In Canada, we market direct. We feel we've got a very, very strong management and a board of directors. Um, I think that, you know, if I had to look at our operations here, our operations are running like a Swiss clock. Uh, we have very, very um, stringent uh, regulations here uh, for COVID. Um, our operations in Langley here uh, are running at full capacity. Um, and uh, if you look at our board of directors, we have a very strong board of directors and I think we're, we're really well positioned well for our, uh, for our growth in the future. Thank you, Paul, I'll turn it back to you. You bet. Um, perfect, thanks, Will. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple, couple questions. Um, and I do wanna remind everybody that uh, there's a chat function. So uh, if you guys have any direct questions that I don't ask, uh, feel free to ask them on the chat and then I'll do my best to, to ask Will. Um, so Will, um, the, you mentioned the number of buses that, um, that you think that you guys uh, sort of can sell into. I think there was a 6,000 for the light version and another, we'll call it 6,000 or 16,000 for the, uh, um, sorry, the, the small heavy duty is 6,000 per year and then the light medium, you figure there's another 6,000 there. I, it, what, what does the bus sell for? Um, and then we can sort of get a, a monetary idea of what the, the total value of the market is. Sure, okay. Well, when, we, when we're looking at the heavy duty product line, in the heavy duty product line, from, uh, you mostly have 40 foot bus sales. A 40 foot bus today on the average diesel bus is selling for about 600, 650,000 Canadian dollars. When we look at the lighter duty model of ours, we're selling ours in around the four hundred to five hundred thousand dollar range on our midsize heavy duty bus in the thirty and thirty five foot range. When we look at the light duty bus, a traditional light duty bus is a, is in the cutaway classification, and when we're look, when we're looking at our vehicle and where it's going to fit into that classification, buses in that range are traditionally in around. 180 to 200, $225,000. And that's where we're gonna fit our, our LT gas model in. When we look at the electric, now electric is totally different. When we look at electric, generally speaking, it's about double the price of a standard diesel bus. So when we look at the heavy duty model, you're about $1.5 million. And when we get into where we're gonna focus on our light duty model, our light duty model in the competitive atmosphere is probably in around 500 to 600,000 US dollars. We're trying to bring, or we're going to bring our light duty model into the market, our electric model in at around a 250,000 US dollar range. Well, so significantly lower. Um, now there's, um, I remember um, in a couple of discussions we've had in the past, there's also a significant um, sort of annual cost uh, savings that you guys have. You guys have a much more maintenance free bus um, a bus that basically costs less to run. Can you give us a sense of what that what that means so yeah, far? What we see in the marketplace, you know, when we when we um, uh, look at it, we're approximately thirty to forty percent cheaper on a uh, um, capital cost. Uh, I'm looking at the heavy duty model right now on a capital cost, and we're running about 30 33 percent 
lower maintenance costs when you when you factor in the total cost of ownership on the vehicle on an operating per year basis. Okay, cool. Now, um, you've had some pretty notable wins as far as uh, large sales to, to government organizations. Maybe, maybe give us give us another rundown of some of the, the, the organizations that you've sold to. Sure. Well, this year, you know, we just, if you look at one of our large news releases that we had uh, earlier in the year, we secured a 92 bus order in the U.S. Uh, with one of the uh, large airlines. Uh, that that we're trying to push through and get uh, get delivered towards the end of this year. And and um, I know a lot of people think of you guys as really just selling to sort of the, you know the buses we see in public transit, but that that's another pretty large opportunity to sell into the sort of the non call it non government uh, organizations that um, that are buying buses. Is that not true? Yeah, yes, it is. You know, we had to work extremely hard to get into this uh, large order. Um, and the competition was pretty fierce, but when you actually factor in, you know, the, the operational costs and the cost of ownership, uh, they went with us. Um, that's a private sale. So uh, when we're looking at private sales are usually um, in the U.S., private sales, uh, one of the nice things about the private sale for us is we don't have to meet the Buy America qualifications on the private sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't, why don't we do that? Why don't we talk a little bit about the Buy America uh, provision? What, uh, what is it and uh, how do you guys sort of get around that? Sure. Well, we don't uh, get around that. What, any product that's sold in the United States that's federally funded, uh, funded by the uh, Federal Transportation Administration, needs to meet a certain criteria. What it needs to meet is 70% U.S. content, and then it has to have an Altoona test provided for it. And then the other item is you need to have final assembly in the United States. So we meet all that criteria. We've already delivered Buy America product in the United States. And those bids are currently, when we're bidding those, those are mostly transit authority bids. So, okay, so um, you know, we've seen a lot of sort of uh, trade issues between Canada and US and in China and all different markets. So you guys, do you see any issues around sort of some of the trade disputes? Well, yeah, we do. You know, um, Canada, we haven't seen uh, any, uh, um, there's been no, uh, no change to the trade uh, disputes uh, currently. Uh, uh, when we're talking trade disputes, mostly we're talking about China and China and the U.S., uh, uh, you know, trade wars and tariffs that have gone on. There is some significant tariffs in the U.S., Canada doesn't have the same tariffs for, for overseas manufacturing. And that's why, you know, when we've looked at it this year, we've really diversified ourselves out. So we wanted to have more of a global footprint, uh, which I tried to discuss a little bit there on, on our business model. So currently, you know, we're capable to manufacture. We have manufacturing as we speak right now going on in Langley for a, a, a small order that we have in Canada. So we can currently manufacture in the U.S. for those Buy America orders. We can manufacture overseas uh, in Asia. Uh, we can manufacture in Europe. And of course, we can manufacture here in Canada. So I think we've diversified out uh, pretty well to meet what the market conditions are. Uh, our Buy America orders, because we have such a high US content on those orders and we meet the criteria, um, generally speaking on the Buy America orders, you're getting a little bit premium price for them as well because of the high content. Cool. Um, maybe, maybe give us a bit of a, a competitive landscape. Who do you typically compete against? I know there's, there's obviously different categories, but um, who do you compete against and what, what's your advantages, disadvantages uh, to these companies? Sure. Well, what I'll use on the Canadian market space here. That's the one that we've got the, the best penetration in. When we currently see bids coming out in the Canadian market, generally there's usually two or three tenders, uh, uh, two or three different competitors. You know, of course, uh, New Flyer is one of our larger competitors. We see them bidding. Um, they have a, a product uh, with Arbok. They purchased, uh, acquired Arbok here a couple of years ago, and they do have a competing product with us. Uh, we'll see um, uh, El Dorado Bus, and that's really the only two other ones that we'll see on the bids. Uh, we have been very competitive on our bids, um, but what I think where it sets us aside now is because we have such a large 
Canadian market share in the uh, in our niche market and our uh, mid-sized market that we're in is that when customers are coming out and retendering now, if you have buses in their fleet, it's a lot easier to win the tenders and you don't necessarily have to be low bid. Um, a lot of the tenders are, are priced accordingly. They'll price it either on a price, uh, give a higher percentage on price or, the, or, uh, or they'll tend to go a higher percentage on um, uh, what they have in their fleet and how the compatibility of their fleet is. Mm -hmm. And we've been extremely successful in retaining the customers that we've had in Canada. Uh, so we've, we've done, you know, an exceptional job. We just need to have that uh, carry on over on the, uh, on the uh, U S side as well. And um, so, I mean, you've got a number of buses that are sort of out in the marketplace right now. Um, Obviously, parts and maintenance become um, a revenue stream as well. Can you give us a sense of sort of revenue breakdown? If, you, if you've got 100 buses out there, what, what percentage of your revenue is, is sort of parts and maintenance or whatever sort of upkeep costs? Yeah, uh, percentage-wise, um, I'm not sure. I haven't got the numbers exactly in front mm -hmm. of me. But having, you know, over 500 buses operating in Canada here, we're starting to see a tremendous amount of reoccurring revenue coming back on those vehicles. You know, the first few years, you have a lot of warranty costs on it, but after they're off warranty, you know, these vehicles are designed for 12 years, you start to see a, a, a fairly healthy, uh, consistent uh, parts supply uh, uh, that we're providing. Um, I think last year we provided approximately 6 million in parts uh, across North America. Um, and the revenue or the uh, profit on those parts are generally speaking are 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the more vehicles that we get out and the longer they're in the lifespan, uh, the better the, the parts uh, sourcing is for us. Mm -hmm. oh, perfect. You mentioned warranty. What's the typical warranty length uh, with your buses? You know, this is where I think we really shine as well. Um, typical warranty on a, on a vehicle you know, they can run up uh, three, four, five percent uh, over time. We're running, I think we're running about two and a half percent warranty costs uh, mm -hmm. on an annual basis, which is extremely low, which, you know, speaks again to the uh, um, high Altoona tests that we got and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the life expectancy of the vehicle. Now, I, I mean, what I always remember is that you guys really, you sort of de-engineered or deconstructed your bus to really fit the market that you guys were going after, as opposed to most of your competitors, they always tried to, you know, sort of fit another older product into the market. Is that is that a fair statement? Y yes, it is. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. So when we designed ours, we entered in, initially entered into a strategic partnership uh, with BC Transit. We had a lot of input on what the market wanted, and then really designed it from the ground up to be a built vehicle. I, I think that's key because being a purpose-built vehicle, you meet all of the requirements uh, of what the customer wants. And of course, you're building a product that's uh, extremely acceptable. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned COVID. Um, let's ask a couple questions around that right now. Um, how, how are you guys operating differently uh, within COVID? And then secondly, how has COVID affected the market opportunity? I, I can just imagine, you know, the, the thinking is that, that public transit has now had to change how they operate. Has that affected sort of your product or your strategy? Well, it has. Uh, you know, we, everybody that's had uh, has been affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this year we were targeting to deliver approximately 200 vehicles. Um, you know, it's, some of them are, are going to spin off into next year. We're still, that's why I say we're, we're pretty bullish on getting 150 units delivered. Um, it definitely has slowed down the delivery schedules and, uh, and the production schedules. But we are uh, running at the capacity uh, and, you know, manufacturing vehicles as we speak. Um, you know, for us, the key was to put a strong COVID plan in place early and really manage it. Uh, um, you know, when you look at our facility out here right now, we just delivered 34 buses out of it and we have a, a, an awful lot currently still going through. Um, you, gotta, you gotta have a, a strong COVID plan in place to ensure that your workers are staying safe. You know, giving a, an example, we have the, somebody come in morning and night and wipe down all the door handles, all the 
touch points of, uh, of uh, um, where people are working. We have a lot of people working from home. Uh, you know, we have, a, uh, we have a lot of engineers on staff. So mm -hmm. a lot of them have been able to work from home. Um, so I think we have a, you know, a very strong COVID uh, plan in place. But the other thing that's happened with the COVID though is, you know, we're expecting a lot of orders to come out earlier in the year. A lot of the RFPs have been delayed. Um, and we're, you know, we're fortunate now I, uh, that we are seeing quite a few of them come out. Uh, we had a news release this morning on, on one of the smaller uh, ones that we just uh, just just got awarded and completed up. And we announce when we do get the purchase order. Um, so, uh, we, you know, we should see quite a few more orders floating through. Transit authorities, uh, we've seen a very you know, big increase in the, the tenders coming out towards the last half of this year, last quarter of this year. So that should trickle through and, and see our... Uh, you know, see our sales pipeline build up substantially for next year. Gotcha. And do you guys do you guys report your backlog? You, you must have um, some form of how many buses are on order right now. Uh, no, we haven't oh, okay. been, um, and I haven't got that data in front of me, Paul. So I can't really share it with you right now. Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, so you mentioned that you're sort of up against capacity in terms of uh, your, your build out right now. Um, Give us a sense of what capacity is. Like, how many buses could you produce in a year right now? Well, we're not uh, we're not really hindered having our global manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, we haven't been hindered by the the uh, process of actually producing the buses. Mm. Um, you know, you get the backlog of you know a part supply and getting your supply chain in order, uh, and that has slowed it down a, a, a little bit uh, for us. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have right now, I have, I think we probably, we have approximately a hundred buses under construction as we speak. Okay. Uh, a lot of those are, we're looking to try to get shipped in, uh, you know, as quickly as we possibly can. I was working with our, uh, overseas team last night on uh, the logistics of getting some of these buses shipped. Once we get them in, we can handle a high capacity. You know, we've put uh, 50 buses a month through our facility here in the past. So it's not, mm -hmm. we're not, uh, you know, wow by the by the process of getting them out the door um, right. it's, getting them in the yard has been the, has been the challenge gotcha and i think i heard you mention earlier that you basically break even around 100 buses a, a year is that correct that's correct yes okay so obviously you know mathematics if you're if you're doing um over 100 then uh you know we're, we're looking at a, a pretty healthy year or at least a break even year um, we're looking. We are looking for a fairly, uh, fairly good year this year. Uh, yeah, definitely opposed to what we did last year. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so uh, the you know you're now you're you're taking a, an electric vehicle to market. Um, give us a sense of timing. When do you think you'll have something ready for the market to you know to to play with? Uh, and what do you anticipate in terms of uh, early orders or sales of some kind? Well, we've, you know, for the electric vehicle, we really took our time getting into the market space. Mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be a huge advantage for us going forward. Um, you know, we've been able to really choose and select the right components going into that electric vehicle. Uh, and, you know, we've probably done something a little different than what most of the manufacturer would do. We, we've really tried to stay to the automotive uh, components. Um, with a, uh, you know, try to line ourselves up with a, a major uh, automotive um, producer uh, and use a lot of the, the off-the-shelf components. Uh, that way, we feel that, one, we're bringing in something that's proven technology. The other is that the price, when you get into the automotive industry, it's, uh, it's really competitively priced over the commercial side. Um, and, you know, we're... We have a lot of interest in the electric vehicle. We're in, uh, we are producing as we speak, uh, and we're trying to get the vehicle in here before the end of the year. But definitely, we'll we'll have our first vehicles in, you know, within the first within Q1 of this coming year. Uh, we have a pent up demand for it, um, pending, you know, uh, uh, specifications and getting some customers to look at it. We we do have uh, some some pretty. Uh, keen interest on the vehicles right now as we speak the electric ones and, and you mentioned that there's significantly lower cost than sort of the the, the competitors uh, electric version 
Um, what, what kind of margins do you get on on the electric bus? What, what are you expecting? Well, our uh, you know traditionally we're running twenty percent margins. Um, we'll have to wait and see what this one's going to be like when we when we get it in the door. But uh, but you know we're we're looking we're shooting for the minimum of, of that sort of range and upwards. Mm -hmm. um, it'll getting the first one in and getting the customers uh, feedback on will definitely be key. We have a, a large convention coming up in March. It's uh, at the convention. It's down in mm -hmm. it uh, comes up every three four years, and we really want to showcase our electric vehicles at that uh, at that trade show. Uh, right momentum going on it but but as as i did say you know we are working on some pre-orders for those electric vehicles as we speak right uh, fantastic um uh i mean resources um you're still a relatively small company um how you guys for finances and and what other resources do you need to be able to continue to build the, the, the business well you know currently um uh, we have a, a strong um ABL asset-based uh, line with uh, RBC uh, is twenty million dollars. It it has been sufficient. We also have about a ten million dollar US uh, line of credit overseas when we're manufacturing, depending on where we manufacture. Uh, and as we come into the end of this year, uh, we really have a, a big turnover um, of our product and. Our balance sheet strengthens significantly as we come through the you know, Q4 this year. Um, that's, I think we'll be in a very, very strong position. Um, you've actually got a pretty impressive uh, background and you, you've got a pretty impressive uh, sort of team that you've put together. Maybe let's talk a bit about that. You, you're a successful entrepreneur. You, you've sort of done this before, as have other members of your team. Why don't you give us a little more color in your background and some of the other players? Well, sure. So my background, you know, I, I come from the heavy construction field. You know, I've owned and operated heavy uh, construction dealerships throughout uh, uh, Western Canada uh, for years. Um, then I got involved in the, in the bus industry. All of the partners, uh, the founders that come into it all have a, an entrepreneurial and a construction background or an engineering background. Uh, but, so that's on the founder side. But when I, when I look at you know, the management side, really you gotta manage the company every day. We've got a very, very strong operations team in here. Uh, um, we have uh, chosen it. Uh, our, our COO, Jonathan, is, uh, he comes from uh, Coast Mountain Translink uh, has a, a, a very, um, a very uh, good background in, in the uh, bus industry. Uh, we, you know, a lot of our engineers come from the bus industry here. Uh, and then just our financial side, you know, our CFO, we've got a, we really have a strong team and it's showing now, you know, particularly as we come into the end of the year and we've got a tremendous amount of volume to, uh, uh, to uh, um, deliver here in Q4, uh, that's that's where you need your strong management side. And you know, I'm I'm really happy with what we have here. But also, you know, when you look at the, the company in itself, you know, operations is running extremely smooth. But when you really look at uh, the the uh, board of directors that we have on too, I've surrounded myself with just a tremendous team. You know, one of our board of directors, uh, Andrew Amasse, comes from uh, El Dorado Bus Company. He built that company up from basically nothing to half a billion dollars and retired. Um, uh, he's a tremendous uh, uh, help uh, with myself here. You know, John Lagorg on the corporate side, um, uh, Joe Miller, uh, uh, you know, a global businessman. Um, and the list just goes on and on. It's, uh, I really, ha and I have an active, board uh, where you know we just don't meet every quarter uh, they're extremely active in the in you know making the decisions and helping me out with some of these key decisions so you know, I, I think that we're just set uh, set for the uh, major growth that we have uh, coming up in place here mm -hmm. and I'd also like to know that I mean a lot of a lot of the sort of the management team have been significant contributors to the financings of these comp of your company so it's you don't, you didn't sort of get your shares for free. You guys put hard dollars into this business. Is that not the case? 
That is truly the case. Uh, you know, when we initially started, it did come with hard dollars into it. Uh, uh, you know, the initial founders, um, you know, we all had to cut very large checks and support it for a long time. Uh, and we're still doing, uh, well, I shouldn't say we're still cutting checks, but we're still supporting it uh, uh, on an ongoing, uh, ongoing basis. Um, and if you look at it, you know, it's public knowledge. You can look back and see nobody sold any shares. I'm one of the largest shareholders of the company. Uh, so when we're looking at it and, you know, myself, I, I want to drive the shareholder value. My, my value of my shares are in ensuring that uh, the shareholder value uh, increases. Uh, you know, we had, uh, there was a time that the shares were doing extremely well. The stock was doing well. You know, I think we we're up th over $3, 350 360 I think we peaked out. I left the company for a while. I uh, had some family issues I had to deal with. Um, stock and uh, did drift down. The company sales drifted down a little bit. The board asked me uh, to come back in. And, uh, you know, since I've come back in, I've, I've really strengthened our management team and, and strengthened our sales team. And, you know, I feel uh, extremely confident and you know, proud of what we're doing and, and where we're going. I, I, I should say you should be proud. I mean, you, you've taken it from an idea to having sold over 500 buses in a very competitive landscape. So I think you should be extremely proud of what you've done. Um, why don't I, at this point, I'm gonna open it up to some questions. I've got a few others, but um, I see we've got a number of questions that I'll, um, I'll ask here. Um, okay, so Dave here asked a couple of questions. Uh, so uh, how, many, how many years does the typical bus last? I know you, we've, we've talked about this in the past, but give us a sense of how long these buses are, are meant to last and how long they do last. Okay, well, when you look at the heavy-duty models, the heavy-duty models are really designed, uh, traditionally designed for a 20-year lifespan. But what the industry has found that to change them out every 12 years is, is, seems to be more economic. So the lifespan of the heavy-duty model needs to last 12 years. Um, and the components that you select and the way you build the bus you need to have a monocoque style constructed frame or you would never get that type of life life that you're getting for the mileage that you put on per year out of the vehicle. Now, when we get into the lighter duty, the lighter duty models, uh, what we're gonna concentrate on are really five year buses. So the transit authorities are buying them and expecting to, to um, wear them out and be finished with them there as a usable product in, in five years. So not only when we look at you know, the, the 6,000 units that per year that we're targeting with our, with our light duty, the, the uh, uh, turnover on that is considerably better, uh, almost you know, it's better than double of what you are on the heavy duty model. So that's what really intrigues us when we're getting into the, the light duty uh, uh, space right now. And our light duty model too, you know, I, I don't know if I said enough about it. It's when you look at it, the competition, builds it on a van style chassis. You know, we build that as a monocoque style and we're coming in really dollar for dollar to meet what the market wants. Uh, we really are keen on what this product's gonna do over the next year. So, so basically for the same dollar cost, you're getting much, much better product. That's really the way to look at it from, from a customer's it, basis. Exactly, with a true low floor vehicle. When you look at, uh, you know, in a shuttle type application or a transit type application, you know, you've got, uh, you've got a lot of people that you need to service and different mm -hmm. types of uh, variety of, of people. Uh, you know, you, you can't forget that there's a lot of disabled people out of there that need to be able to have access to a vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, access to a vehicle with a low floor is very user friendly. You roll on, you roll off. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what our light duty product offers to the market. Yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to be in a couple of your buses and I gotta admit, they're, they're pretty slick. They're, they're quite a nice vehicle. So if anybody ever gets a chance, I think you'd, you'd really see that it's different than just the, the normal bus you see day to day. Um, okay, so here's another question. How long does it to typically take to deliver a bus? Maybe, maybe walk us through you know, the whole process, yeah. Sure, well, when we're delivering, um, you know, on a, on a private order, we can deliver fairly quickly. We could probably get a private order out in six months. But on a transit style tenders, every tender that we bid, and we're not unusual for anybody else, we put, it's usually 12 months from date of uh, purchase order. But they'll, uh, the average time frame is probably somewhere between seven and nine. 
for delivery. But you, you, you always try to um, give yourself 12 months for the delivery time frame. Okay, so 12 months. Um, as, so we, we've spoken of selling to Canada and selling to the U.S., but have, have you sold outside of uh, North America? No, we haven't. Uh, um, not at this point. And any, any plans to? No, I think we really need to get the U.S. up and operating first, and then we'll then we'll uh, take a look at some of the other markets. I do think that, you know, this light duty product that we're building would be suitable for a lot of the uh, European and some of the other areas. Mm -hmm. Now, so um, you you know when you sell a bus to a government organization, I imagine there's probably you know you know if they if they want an extra ten buses out of whatever the order is, that there's there's room to grow it. Um, but uh, do, do you ever, I mean, do customers ever just come back and say, okay, we like the last one so good that we want, we want a bunch more or is it, is it mostly RFPs? Yeah, no, the RFPs that are coming out aren't usually for one time off. The RFPs are generally for three to five years. So we love these larger uh, size contracts with the transit authorities across Canada because it gives them the opportunity to come back and reorder off of them. And we get an awful lot of reorders. The transit authorities don't want to come out and do a tender every year. So traditionally, you'll see a minimum of three and usually they'll, they'll run for five-year contracts. Okay, okay. And um, do, you, do they tend to diversify their their supply of vehicles or do you um like do governments even think that way or they just say okay here's an rp we need 100 buses boom there's 100 buses do they ever say we don't want the risk of one business or one, another business um being too concentrated and, and diversify in order yeah they do so okay. what we see when we're getting uh when we get a tender out and we actually win a tender uh, the first tender that, that a, a transit authority comes out, if they haven't had any mid-sized buses, uh, um, it'll it'll have a quite a opening on it. It'll uh, you know mostly be price uh, uh, very price sensitive. So generally, it'll say maybe thirty or forty percent of the contract is going to be va uh, going to be um, uh, valued on the price. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll they'll, uh, they'll put it out accordingly. You know, so much for service, so much for technical support, uh, so much for hitting the the, the spec, uh, specified um, um, criteria that they put into it. Then, when you go back, once you've got uh, a large fleet into one of the transit authorities, then they tend to stay with your product uh, because they don't want to change up too much. Then, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, the um... Oh, here's an interesting question. So we, we talked about various different buses and different sort of categories of buses. Do you ever think, are you ever thinking of expanding outside of the bus uh, market? Uh, well, right now we're just focused on selling buses, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, that is an interesting question because there's a, our bus, particularly the smaller unit that we have coming in, there's a lot of chassis sales. So there is some opportunities. I haven't focused on it. We haven't looked at it, done the research on it, but there's an awful lot. Uh, an example would be, you know, an RV. So, uh, you know, our platform would really be suited for an RV as well, but we'll conquer, you know, we'll get in and get some orders on the, on the order book first, and then we'll look at what other ones we can diversify out to. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you'd mentioned this, uh, in one of our discussions, but some of these buses really take a beating and they, they, they put on quite a few miles. Maybe give us a sense of, of, some, you know, some of the, the conditions that some of these buses have to meet and, and how long or how many miles they have to put on per year. Sure. Well, you can get anywhere from 90 to, you know, a hundred, over a hundred thousand kilometers put on a bus per year. If you're running a light duty bus and you're getting 60,000 kilometers, that would be very, very rare. So they're, they're high mileage units uh, when they go out. The transit authorities traditionally want to be able to operate this bus for 10 to 12 hours. Uh, and in most instances, sometimes uh, you're, you know, you're looking at only an eight hour break in between, uh, uh, in between shifts, just enough to service it and get it out for the morning again. It's, it's brutal uh, conditions. Uh, and that's why, you know, if you build a strong bus and it's going to stand up to the conditions of it, uh, you really build yourself a, a good name in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I mean, I just remember one of the buses I saw. It, uh, you guys really thought of all the little, little sort of, I wouldn't say tricks, but the comfort of the bus driver and and the the, the height of the bus and where the seats are is pretty impressive. You guys have really thought everything through as much as you can. Well, we I, we certainly you know think we have, um, and you know we're getting sales for it now, and uh, you know the Canadian markets respond extremely well to. To our product, but uh, this is what I was saying earlier. You know, we had the opportunity to actually build a bus from the ground up, mm -hmm. so uh, and get the input of what what the customers wanted. Um, and in doing so, we we've, we've got a lot of different items on our bus than what you'd find on others. You know, I'll give you an example. When we're building the first bus, uh, it's a shuttle. It has to a shuttle is a little different than a than a transit downtown transit application. Downtown transit stop and go. Average speed could be, you know, 10 to uh, uh, 20 kilometers per hour on an average. Uh, when you get into a shuttle application, the bus has to be designed to go from point A to point B. It's got to pick the people up in the suburbs and really get it get it out to, uh, you know, the SkyTrain. Uh, get it out to a place where you've got a higher, higher volume going. Um, and travel between uh, um, uh, municipalities or cities. So, you know, our bus had to be designed to actually get up and do freeway travel speeds um, and do it comfortably. Uh, so when we designed our bus, we really looked at it and put an independent front suspension in it, something that really rides a lot nicer and gives it, gives it the uh, ability to, to travel on the, uh, on the highways uh, uh, with a very comfortable ride. You know, we designed ours to give a very roomy um, design inside. So if you're sitting in the bus, the windows are actually larger than a standard uh, transit bus. So you bring them down a little lower, you get you get uh, uh, more air or more light coming in. Uh, the customers feel a lot more roomier inside. And it just goes on and on. You know, we put uh, special sound insulation. Uh, I could rattle on for hours on this ball. It's, uh, <laughs> I know. Now, like I said, it's it's a very impressive bus. I was I was very uh, very impressed with one, uh, you know, what I saw. Um, listen, we, we've seen one of your, I'll, I'll call it a quasi-competitor, but there's another company that uh, just recently listed on NASDAQ, uh, did a large financing one, once they got there. Um, any any goals of uh, uplisting uh, in the future? Uh, you know, we always look at that sort of thing in the future, of course. Um, you know, it will be in a better position come out of a Q4 this year on the financial uh, uh, side that I want to see the company in. And then of course, we'll start looking at exploring some of those, uh, some of those opportunities. Um, but uh, for now, we're just staying where we are. But uh, uh, once the balance sheet's uh, looking a lot better uh, with these uh, sales uh, uh, deliveries in, uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, perfect. Um, refresh my memory, do you, do you guys have any um, um, broker coverage right now? Is there anybody covering the stock? Yeah, we have uh, Beacon Securities covers us, um, mm -hmm. and I've seen some coverage on them. Okay, uh, not too terribly much, but in the past we have had some. Gotcha. And and recently just hired investor relations and outside investor relations uh, group. Um, what what kind of message do you want to? And we we can sort of almost wrap up here with this last question. But if there's a message you really want investors to take away today. What's, what is that? And, and what, what do you want the investment community to really look forward to as, as far as Grande West? Well, you know, I, I personally think we've been undervalued for years. Um, as I stated, you know, I'm a large shareholder. The, the insiders and founders still have 30%. We want to see shareholder value up there. We want to see, you know, uh, shareholder value grow. We hired uh, a new IR firm really to get our uh, market awareness out there. You know, I think we've got a great product. We've uh, we've got deliveries uh, going through. Uh, we're going to end up with a, a, a you know, a, a good position at the end of the year. Uh, you know, our electric vehicle, um, you know, we, we will be putting out some news releases and, you know, some uh, launch on what we're doing with the electric vehicle. And then I'll be able to, you know, give some more details on, you know, who we, what uh, um, components we chose and why we chose it. And um, I, I just think we want to, you know, we want to get that market awareness out there and, and get the true value of what the company is uh, reflected. Mm -hmm. So um, 
so I'm, I'm going to summarize a little bit. So we, we've got Grande West. You guys have been at this now for several years. You've basically taken an idea from scratch to having sold over 500 buses that are out there running right now. Unlike a lot of sort of recent companies that have kind of popped up with, with an idea, they haven't really, you know, produced anything close to what you guys have. So you, you've accomplished quite a bit there. But I, I think going forward, you guys have a viable uh, entrant into the electronic vehicle uh, part of the business, which obviously has got a lot of excitement because, of, you know, the Teslas and the Nikolas and, and, and so forth in the world. So um, it sounds like you guys are, you know, really embarking and taking your existing platform and, and moving into, you know, pretty exciting time. Um, I think you guys have done a great job so far. I really commend you for, for having done uh, something in such a very competitive and and uh, almost confusing landscape. So I think uh, congratulations. Um, you know, you're you're now out there trying to get the, the message to the market. So I think, um, you know, good luck with that. I think uh, you guys uh, will, will get a lot of people uh, paying attention. Your stock just hit a new 52 week high. So obviously somebody's, uh, somebody's starting to pay attention. And um, listen, well, I, I want to really thank you for, for taking time today and uh, and getting us updated on Grande West. Any, anything that you want to add to it or or uh, we covered enough today? No, I think we covered a lot and uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on today. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. And we, hey, listen, we look forward to catching up with you, especially once the once you got your electric buses on the road. Love to, love to see, uh, uh, you know, a video of one of them or maybe hopefully even riding one but at this point trev i'll hand it back to you and uh let you wrap up for us thanks paul and uh before we sign off will if anybody's looking for more information about grande west where, where can they find that uh, what's your website it's uh grandewest.com and if somebody would like to connect with you can they can they call you can they email you how what's the best way to contact the company Sure. Uh, you know, I think IR at uh, grandewest.com uh, and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on that uh, link as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Will, and uh, looking forward to the launch of the EV bus and future financials. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.